Brian Moretta. I work for Harmon & Co. As Andrew alluded to, we are independent research providers. Uh, for about 20 or so years, we've been working primarily in the equity market. Last two or three years, we have uh, entered what we call the tax-enhanced market, writing research on venture capital trusts, enterprise investment schemes. We've done one or two other funds as well, um, and we're sort of establishing ourselves um, as a provider of multiple services, including some training and some panel services. So today, I'm going to talk about the exciting topic of fees and why they aren't fun. Um, so fees in some sense are like the Harry Potter of the financial asset management world. On the one hand, you have the muggles of the investors. And to muggles, they want to stick them under stairs. You know, they're not, they're not, they don't really want fees. And they're not really that interested in fees. But they do matter to them, even if they don't know it. Um, for advisors, wizard, the financial wizards, they're great because that's why we get paid. Um, so this is a generally, this is topical, um, partly because the FCA made it topical. Um, so last year they issued a report. There's no reason why financial advisors should have seen this. This was really aimed at the asset management industry, but it will have some profound effects um, depending on how they act on it. Um, so I've picked out a couple of things that I think uh, are interesting. Um, so the first thing is how much do investors know? So anyone any idea how, what proportion of investors are aware of the fees that they're paying? 5%. 5%. Okay. Lower. Lower. Okay. So this is the graph of how, this, not, not the actual amount, it says do you pay fund charge to your most recent investment product? And less than half are aware that they're even paying fees. So this suggests there's a wide degree of ignorance out there about um, how it's, what, um, whether they're actually paying fees at all, and as a consequence, how much they are paying. Um, and the SA clearly want to change this. Um, having said that, they've been looking to change these things as long as I've been in financial services. And I think there are one or two people who might be, have been around possibly even longer than I have. So um, this is not a new topic, but clearly it's going to get a bit of renewed focus in the asset management industry. There were two other figures in this report that I wanted to highlight. One you've probably seen before. So this is a comparison of what happens in funds if you've got active management charges or passive management charges. And what you'll see is the usual difference. Active management costs a lot more than passive, or significantly more than passive management. And over a long time, that makes a difference. So the red line, the top line, is the active management. Um, and right at the bottom, no, sorry, red line's where you've got passive charges. So you can see that under their assumptions, you've got a fund that goes to about 47,000. Active management takes that down to oh, somewhere between 30 and 35. So the difference between active and passive management can be very significant over long term, over 20 years. And you've probably all seen something like that before. This, I think, is the really interesting chart, um, which maybe just displays my mathematical bent. And I'm just going to talk through one or two things. So at the bottom, we have the tracking error. So tracking error is how much a fund will vary from its benchmark. Um, and on the, the y-axis, we, we have the, call, the, the charges. Um, and that's the total charges. So a fund with a low tracking error is going to stay pretty close to the benchmark. A fund with a high tracking error is going to be far away. So the SCI have highlighted two areas. So you can see here, we've got these funds taking modest position at a high price. So what that means is you've got funds charging 2% and a tracking error of 1%. That condemns the investor to underperformance. There's almost no way, it's a very small probability, that the, the, man, that the investor is actually going to get a return in excess of the benchmark. Whereas here, you have funds taking um, significant risk at, or oh well, or significant, significant deviation from the benchmark um, at, a, at a modest cost. These are the funds where you have a chance of getting out performance. So th the FCA want to see more of these, less of these, and instead of here, the, the, perf the sort of orangey ones, that's your passive funds. So where your strategy will be going 
is you're going to be mixing your portfolio. So if you're in something where you want a tracking error of, say, 2% on average, then you can save significant money by, say, putting a large chunk of the portfolio, 50%, um, 75%, 75% in a passive fund, and then make up the rest in something that's actually going to deliver some, you know, has the potential to deliver some performance. Um, and that will, if nothing else, save you costs um, and actually give you a better chance of delivering what the client wants. So there are some issues that complicate this picture. One is no fees equal no pay. For better or for worse, we are all paid out of the fees. Um, this is one reason why we like them. Um, and we're not charities. We're not going to work for nothing. So there has to be a flaw somewhere. And it's all about being paid fairly for what we do, I think, um, rather than anything else. Scale is not everything if you want active management. What I mean by that is, as you're all aware, the larger a fund is, the harder it is to, make, to build positions. Doug referred earlier to about the ease of building positions if you want uh, to dev you know, if in, in, or the difficulty if you want small cap investments. These are the positions that will make the difference in a lot of funds. These are ones where you'll actually get deviation from the benchmark. These are the things that can generate the outperformance. If you've got a three or a five billion fund, it's really hard to get these sort of positions. So sometimes just investing with a big manager isn't going to give you what you want. The, the other little secret, small cap investing can be more expensive to do. You have um, the issues you've got because of that. Sometimes you've got lax economies of scale, particularly in the EIS and VCT world. Um, you, you know, so it, in a VCT, if you want to double the size of fund, you have to double the number of investments. If I'm running a FTSE fund, if I double the size of fund, I can just take positions twice the size. So that means there's reduced economies of scale, and the costs in the small cap world are more. So when you see sort of slightly higher fees in, sm in small cap funds, EIS funds, there's a reason for that. It's not that they're greedy, um, though they may be. Um, and this is especially true in the EIS world. CIS VCTs. The other issue that the SA have raised is disclosure does not equal transparency. So what, what I mean by that is that it's quite easy to sort of say what you're doing, um, but that doesn't necessarily help the investor. So, so these are the fees in our EIS and SEIS database. So we have a, have a database. Um, I'm going to focus on EIS and SEIS. And these are all the different fees that people have um, listed. Um, now, you'll see there's one or two of them. Actually, there's 44 on the list. Um, um, and so, so this is something that um, I, I think a lot of people in the sector have said, OK, we want people to understand why we're charging more. And they've gone for what they think is transparency and disclosure. And so things like. I, paper and stationery, I don't care what you spend at Staples. You know, it, 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 it's gone too far. Um, another way of putting this is here's the number of fees per product in the EIS and SEIS space. So obviously, less is better. Um, one, two, so three, I think, is sort of the base if you think you've got initial fee, annual fee, and some sort of exit performance fee. So three is the sort of Norm, eight is going to get kind of complicated. And especially when you have fees that are sometimes charged per fund, sometimes as a percentage of assets, sometimes per client, it's very difficult to work out actually what is being paid. And I find I struggle at times. And I'm an actuary. I've got a PhD in statistics. If I'm struggling, your average investor is going to find it almost impossible. I'm pleased to say that actually, I, I can honestly say I'm standing up here um, I know Par have just recently changed their fee terms to make them slightly simpler. We're able to say, I know Amati a couple of years took out the performance fee out of the VCTs, so we have two fund managers here who are on the right side of this trend. Um, I would have still put this up regardless, so <laughs> don't worry, I'm not just pandering to, <laughs> to, to them. Um, so what we're going to see 
Um, the SEA have this proposal. How this actually pans through, I don't know. Introducing an all-in fee approach to quoting charges so investment funds can easily see what has been taken from the fund. So we are going to see, I think, some sort of better disclosure, simpler disclosure. There is going to be a challenge for some, of, some parts of the industry where they have set up fees that to some extent correspond to their costs. So in the EIS world, um, the initial fees do roughly correspond to their diligence costs, um, sometimes a bit less actually. Their annual fees do correspond to what they're, uh, the cost of actually monitoring on an ongoing basis. And really all these things do is put the lights on um, and make sure they can afford to take the bus home. It's only when they get the performance fee at the end, sometimes, that's um, where they make any, actually make any money. Um, so this is going to be, if this goes ahead, this is going to be quite disruptive. It will be good for you guys as advisors because it will make um, it a lot more transparent and you can see what's going on a lot easier. But it will cause a bit of disruption in the fund management space. So for the second sort of part of what I want to speak about, uh, sticking with fees, I want to talk about a way of thinking about fees that may be helpful. Um, it may not be. Um, and this is thinking about fees as incentives. So in a rational world, people respond to their incentives. And for fund managers, their incentives are the fees. Um, so what you as an investor or an advisor want to think about is how are the manager's interests aligned with investors? Oh, I didn't expect a pause for that. <laughs> <laughs> so annual management fees. So the incentive for an annual management fee is basically gather assets. The more assets you have, the greater your management fee. For listed funds, if you perform well, your assets under management grow. So there is an, actually an incentive to perform well as well. There's also a, dis, um, a sort of reverse disincentive in that if you don't perform well, the assets tend to drift out the door as well. If you're with uh, institutional clients, they'll go quite quickly. If you retail clients, they'll go slower. But at the end of the day, underperformance will lead to the funds going. Um, and that's so, that, so for listed funds, an annual fee management fee will actually give you some incentive to perform. Um, if you're in the SEIS, EIS sort of space, um, the fee is based on the assets that you invest. So there is actually no incentive for managers to perform there. And hence, we have these things called performance fees. So performance fees, typically 20% of outperformance. The FCA are interested in these. They note that often this is not relative to the investment objective. Um, so sometimes you get, um, in listed funds, you'll get uh, a performance fee based on a cash return, when actually they should be compared against uh, an equity benchmark. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that this is a trend that is improving in the industry, um, but it's still, um, we see some people getting money for old rope, and I think particularly the hedge fund area is um, quite bad for this. So, if we want to think about uh, a performance fee, what is it? It's actually a call option on the assets. So, in essence, you have a strike price. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, you've got an issue price, a strike price of whatever the benchmark is at the time for, for the outperformance. Um, and you can value that, in theory. Now, options, the value of options depends on two things. Depends on your respect to return, and it depends on your volatility. So the value to the manager is maximized by increasing the return or increasing the risk. Now, what you as an advisor have to think about, which one is easiest for the manager to change? Now, for some people, increasing return is possible. And focusing on increasing the return of the investment process it can be done. Risk is actually often a lot easier to change. So sometimes for a fund manager, they can get more of a performance fee by taking more risk than they are telling you about um, without actually t giving your client any be beneficial return. In some places like EIS, this is less of an issue because you're already in as risky investment as a client will be interested in. Um, when you're coming to maybe listed equity funds or um, other vehicles, that's more of an issue. 
But the great thing about performance fees is that they're only paid if, an, if there's an exit. So here, for in the SEIS, EIS, SEIS world, it gives the manager an incentive to actually exit because here's something where they get paid when you get realized. So they are useful as an incentive. I want to talk about also about fees against expect performance. I'm just going to give an example here. So an example charges 2% a year plus 20% performance fee. So this is not atypical in the EIS world. Um, uh, it's not atypical in the hedge fund world still, although fees are coming down the area. So if you assume a 25% gross return over four years, then a little bit of mass, 2% fees for four years, adding that, 9.6%. 20% performance fee, 3.08%. Not going to ask you to verify those. So for every £10,000 invested, the investor gets a net gain after fees of £1,232. The fees that are paid under those circumstances are £1,268. In other words, with a standard fee structure on a 25 cent return, the manager is getting paid more than the investor. I don't think this is right. I'll leave it to you whether you think it's right. Um, that's only my opinion. If we take, say, 60% gross return, then the fee shares falls to 33%. And this is something you probably know unconsciously. Um, because you've seen it before in so, some of the things. But the fees should not be looked at in the, uh, it, separate from the expected return that you're getting. The lower the return that you expect on the asset, the more the fees are going to matter. If you're investing in a bond fund, you're expecting 2 or 3% a year, you don't want a 2% fee on that. If you're investing in EIS where you're going to maybe get 15% a year, you can maybe take that to a 2% charge, 3% charge easier. And I think in EAS, that's a real issue because we do have things that are targeting 20% over three years. And they're charging 2% a year or 3% a year. Um, you know, I think people like, you know, Parr, who are taking, you know, saying, right, we're going to get this 15% IR. You, you actually have the high return and you can take that, that, that cost. So given we are, I think, we're all accepted in a different place from where we were 10 years ago, I think this is a very important thing for advisors to be thinking about. Final point I'm going to make is the um, detail matters. So I'm going to give an example here of one of my favorite bugbears in the industry. So I'm going to give a performance fee example, and I'm going to compare two things. So a performance fee based on the fund return. So in other words, if, if a fund makes two, two pounds um, on a one pound investment, it's made a pound, 20% performance fee, 20% of one pound. Against performance fees payable on the performance of individual companies. So, um, so that would be if, if a fund's invested in three companies, one company does well, it takes the, the, the fee on that, doesn't on the other two. Now, the easy question is, which one pays out mo most? The second one. So I'll give you an example. So imagine two investments. I always include one of these in my talks. So um, two investments of one pound of each of A and B. Total investment of two pounds. We're going to imagine that investment A goes up 50%, investment B goes down 50%. So your net return is zero. So, if, if we charge a, a performance fee on a portfolio basis, then there's no return, there's no performance fee, the investor gets their two pounds back. However, if we do it on a per company basis, on company A, your 20% performance fee, you're taking 10p out. Um, so, investor return is now £1.90 instead of two pounds. So, on aggregate, the investor has paid a 5% performance fee for nothing. There is no performance. And actually, it's quite easy to show that um, if, if you've got a, a company performance, per company performance fee, you always pay more in performance fees than you do compared to a portfolio. And having done some math recently, 
um, it's probably between 10 and 25% more. So at the top end, that's saying instead of a 20% performance fee, it's equivalent to a 25% performance fee on a portfolio basis. And given for a lot of managers, the, portfolio, the performance fee is the single biggest fee you're paying, that can be quite a difference. So, um, and probably somewhere around 20%, I would guess, of EISs have performance fees on this basis. So, just because they're sort of saying these are performance fees, you have to look at the detail as well. So, in summary, the SA thinks fees matter, and if they think they matter, who am I to disagree with them? Disclosure is not the same as transparency. I think just because they're saying what the fees are doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy for us as investors to decide what that actually means. If you've got low returns, the fees matter more. And the devil, as always, is in the detail of these things. Um, I think that's me taking up most of my time. So I will stop there.